Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I had the honor of being here with someone very special in the Bitcoin community, Dennis Porter. Dennis is CEO and co-founder of the Satoshi Action Fund. He is also president and founder of Satoshi Action Education with the mission of advancing Bitcoin policy and spreading awareness of all the many benefits of Bitcoin mining. Dennis, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, Ro. Thank you so much for having me on, and I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. Awesome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Well, what I'd like to begin with is Bitcoin. Many call it digital gold, energy, the alternative currency, a storage of value, a future global reserve asset. What is Bitcoin to you, Dennis? I'm, uh, I tend to be one of those all of the above uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, I, I think that it has the potential to bring multiple waves of innovation to the United States and to the entire world. I think we have you know, two things we're talking about here, right? We have Bitcoin, the asset which is the soundest money that human beings have you know, ever devised. And then we also have you know, Bitcoin mining, which is one of the most powerful tools for advancing our energy systems. Um, I would even say you know, since the advent of electricity itself. So we have two very powerful pieces of technology that have been developed or created by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009. And 14 years later, we're just starting to understand just how powerful this technology can be for advancing the human cause. And I'm particularly focused on Bitcoin mining for the work that I do. But, uh, you know, Bitcoin, the asset, very, very important for, for, you know, thousands of years, longer even, human beings have been using money as a technology. And for thousands of years, human beings have been, you know, corrupting and debasing that money at, at any chance given, especially those in positions of leadership and power. We don't need to look too far back to notice or understand just how bad things can be get when you debase currency. Uh, you go all the way back to the Roman Empire. You can see that during that time, the Roman Empire was debasing the silver denarii so much that their soldiers were, were no longer willing to guard the large militarized border that Rome had developed. And when you have a large militarized border and soldiers that are not willing to guard it, you can quickly understand why Rome fell from its place so quickly. Now, there were other factors that led to the collapse of Rome, but that was a significant contributor to why Rome collapsed. And that was because they decided to debase money too far because you can debase it, and but there's a certain point when you go too far. There's a couple other quick examples I'd like to give as well, just to kind of help people understand why it's so dangerous to debase currency to the levels to the point where we might be doing it today. I don't know. We, we don't know, right? Because there's a point where money breaks and we don't know when that point is, but we seem to be coming, we're definitely becoming much, much closer to it. Another example of this would be during the transatlantic slave trade. So the, during that time in history, in the 1700s, the African nations to the South were using glass agribeads as a form of currency. Because during that time, although the African nations were advanced in many other ways, they did not have advanced glass making abilities. So what happened was when the Europeans from the north came south, they brought with them glass because they had glass advanced glass making abilities. But the Africans did not know this. And so when they came south, the Africans thought that there was very large amounts of valuable currency being imported into their economy. In fact, there was so much of it being imported into their economy that Africans themselves were willing to sell themselves into slavery. But it was ultimately for a lie. This currency was worthless and it was completely debased uh, and corrupted. And that is part of the reason why you would see this incredible acceleration of the transatlantic slave trade. You know, one of the most horrendous and evil things that has ever occurred in modern history is because of currency debasement. Now, we don't need to look uh, too much further back for this example, but there's also one last one I'd like to give. During uh, the Weimar Republic's collapse, they printed their currency into infinity, uh, hyperinflated that currency, and the Weimar Republic collapsed, and it led to the rise of Nazi Germany and the rise of Hitler. 
And we don't need to explain in detail too much, you know, the horrendous and horrific events that took place because of the rise of Nazi Germany, um, the Holocaust, World War II, what are catastrophic levels of destruction on our society. And again, all of this very close, very, very close in history to when currency collapses or when currency dies. So we know when we debase and destroy our currencies, very, very, very horrible things happen. We're doing that today. We don't know how much further we can push it, but it's something that we need to be very careful about. And But, but the point being that for the first time now in history, we have Bitcoin as a money which cannot be debased, which cannot be corrupted. And so for who knows how long it'll take for a society to adopt this new currency. But at the end of the day, once we do adopt it, and if Bitcoin does achieve its mission of becoming a global reserve currency, we will have a currency that can survive through generations and generations without any sort of manipulation by central powers or central banks or by those in power, which really could result in the saving of lives. It could result in the saving of society and prevent wars. So that it's it's just on its own. Bitcoin is incredibly powerful and necessary, I believe, to make sure that we do not allow those in power to continue to base money to the point of you know societal destruction. That's one side of the coin, right? <laughs> so to speak, not, no pun intended. Uh, the other side is that we have Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin mining is going to itself because of its unique load profile, because of the unique way that it uses electricity as a customer, lead to incredible advancements in our energy systems. There are many problems on the grid today. I think everybody is aware of that. We're seeing increasing blackouts and brownouts, which is odd as a technological society moving forward. Why do we seem to be moving backwards when it comes to energy? Part of the reason is because of the type of energy policy that we are pursuing in this country and across the world. We all want to electrify and decarbonize at the same time. Now, I'm not against either of those things, but when you electrify and you decarbonize at the same time with generation assets like renewables, you're going to run into some very serious problems. Renewables are an intermittent generation resource, which means that they only create power certain times of the day. Kind of easy to explain, right? We you only create power when the wind is blowing, the sun is shining mm -hmm. with renewables. Well, unfortunately, customers on the grid are not intermittent. They want power when they want power. They want it right away. And in the past, with coal, with gas, with nuclear, and even with hydro to some extent, you had this kind of consistent base load of power that could be provided to customers when they needed it. Wind and solar don't do that. They are not an on-demand power source. So this is creating all sorts of havoc on the grid which needs to be kept in constant balance all the time. You, you cannot have less power available than what customers want because that is when brownouts and blackouts start to occur. And the interesting thing about brownouts and blackouts is that those are being, those, are, those happen because grid operators are trying to save the grid from collapse. If you get into a situation where there's not enough available supply on the grid and there's too much demand and you don't do perform rolling brownouts and blackouts, there will be called what's called a system-wide outage, a black start. It's the worst possible thing that could possibly happen on a grid. It almost happened in Texas just about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And just save it from happening, 7 million people plus, millions of people went out without power for days. So in order to prevent those things from happening, you have to have this rolling brownouts, rolling blackouts. And instead of doing that, though, some, some new systems that people have come up with Instead of saying, okay, well, let's just shut off power for other people like on forcibly, they've come up with new programs. These new programs are called demand response, frequency response is its little brother. And they use these programs to say, okay, is there a customer out there who would be willing to shut off so that we don't have to shut anyone else off? Or maybe we don't have to build these expensive and carbon intensive peaker plants to compensate for this problem. So if these programs have been being built for decades. Some are participating, but there's a lack of participation. We'll enter Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is a very consistent, very powerful draw, but very flexible draw of power. And that's very critical for demand response type programs. In order for someone to participate in a demand response program and actually have a significant impact, they need to use a lot of power because they need to return a lot of power. If just me and you are shutting our lights on and off, it's not going to have a big impact. It's not going to be enough energy. But Bitcoin mining can use to potentially gigawatts of power when also nobody needs it. And then when the grid does need it, when there's some sort of an emergency, they can shut off, return that power back to the grid, 
and save ratepayers and potentially save ratepayers from rolling brownouts and blackouts. And we saw this exact same. I'll, I'll finish here, but we saw it on this this segment. I know I'm going a little while here, but I think it's important Love to make these points. We saw this happen in Texas. We saw what happens when there wasn't Bitcoin mining and when there was. In 2021, when that winter storm hit, the entire grid almost collapsed. Millions went without power. And then about six to eight months later, maybe about a year later, China decided to cede its leadership on Bitcoin mining. They decided to ban Bitcoin mining in the state or in the nation of China. And the CCP, because of its lack of foresight and vision and understanding this technology, forced all of those Bitcoin miners across the ocean divide into the United States. And they, most of them came to Texas. And now Texas is number one in the world in Bitcoin mining. Mm. Since then, since that occurred, months later, another big winter storm came through. And because there was this new toolbox in the toolbox in Texas for their energy systems, those miners were able to wind down and return 1,500 megawatts of power during that emergency, which is enough power to, you know, put it in context, 1,500 megawatts, most people don't understand what that number means. That means that's enough power to heat 1.5 million small homes. It's an incredible amount of power. You could also energize 300 large hospitals. So right when customers need it the most, right when in the middle of this emergency, when no one else is able to return that much power, you have Bitcoin mining coming in, saving the day. And, and you're, the you know, last point here is that you're going to see more and more events like this occur, not only because we see volatility picking up in our weather, but because we have over here, again, renewable causing more it to... constantly collapsing and falling around us. Oh, wonderful, amazing points, uh, Dennis. Um, I love, we started with Bitcoin, you went right into the Bitcoin mining. We have so many challenges nowadays from, like you mentioned, extreme weather to debasement of currencies, and we need to find solutions. And challenges always bring forth new opportunities and birth new industries. And I think you nailed it. Bitcoin mining appears to be the solution we need. Now let's go back to Bitcoin. Inelastic supply, that's exactly what you were referring to. Meanwhile, central banks keep printing currency and continuing to debase it while Bitcoin has an inelastic supply. I believe it's 21 million, correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Okay, well, that's all we're ever going to get. So you're not going to have that debasement. It is the increase in money supply that causes this inflation. You know, too much money chasing too few of goods and services. And there you go, Bitcoin right there. And we need to prevent that from occurring. I love your historical references. You know, it's very important. Those who don't know their history are condemned to repeat it. And you brought up the Roman Empire. What greater example than that? And thank you so much for taking us through history to demonstrate the importance of adoption of Bitcoin. And, you know, it's important that we think differently. And I think that's what we're here to do today is to enlighten people to the current challenges that we have and that we need these new solutions to combat and overcome these challenges, which are only, as you said, getting worse. We're having a decline in productivity on the business side. There's so many issues. And the way to increase productivity is through automation and blockchain. So um, I wanna go into all these benefits in detail and how Bitcoin mining can help on the grid, the economy and the environment. But first, Dennis, I wanna know, how did you get involved with all this? Did you just wake up one day and say, Bitcoin is the way? And the Satoshi Action Fund, amazing organization that you co-founded. Tell us how you got started. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh 2017, I ran into a friend and he told me that Bitcoin was perfectly anonymous internet money uh, that couldn't be traced. And I said, you know, that's you know BS. You know, as someone who was pretty familiar with the way the internet worked and technology, I knew virtually everything was traceable and trackable uh, in our lives. And so I went on to go study Bitcoin to kind of prove him wrong, right? I was like, there's no way that this can be used this way. And in that journey of studying Bitcoin to try to prove my friend wrong, 
I learned a lot about Bitcoin and found things that I that were, you know, I believe to be today some of the you know the building blocks of why I believe Bitcoin is so important for the world. Now, I did end up proving that Bitcoin is not perfectly anonymous internet money. There is you know some ways to track and trace it. That being said, there is definitely some privacy improvements over the current system for sure. Uh, but in that journey of trying to prove my friend wrong, I found that Bitcoin is going to be one of the most powerful technologies for helping us to provide financial services to the disenfranchised, to minorities, to communities of color, to folks that are worried about being discriminated against because of their race, sex, gender, sexual orientation, or political affiliation. I found that this system could be used to be able to protect those people, to bank the unbanked. And so that was my initial really big drawing into the space. But I would, I would encourage people to look up the early videos of Andreas Antonopoulos. As soon as I got into Bitcoin, that was one of the first people I found. Incredibly smart man and really had a good way of understanding Bitcoin in a way that most people could get it, even though he's you know, highly technical. I would, if you're a highly technical person, I would also encourage you to grab his book, Mastering Bitcoin. I've read it a few times, more, more than a few times. It's kind of like a foreign language if you're not a technical person, but that is where my kind of the building blocks of my understanding of Bitcoin started. The moment I found Bitcoin, I was like thinking in my head, I need to do something for this technology. I need to help get this technology out there. Or I just need to, I just need to build a business around this technology at least. And I started off by trying to design an app, got really big into teaching myself how to code, even though I hate learning new languages. Mm -hmm. And partway through, I saw someone that was in the world, in the space, kind of also building what I was trying to build. And they were kind of just light years ahead of where I was on my idea. So I was like, I'll put the kibosh on that. Let's focus on something else. Jumped into Bitcoin mining right away. Started mining uh, 2017, 2018. Very much enjoyed that experience. I taught myself how to... Uh, onboard the mining, how to do electrical work, how to build my own kind of like containerized box so that I could point it outside my house so that get the heat out, uh, was working on airflows, understanding how to do noise dampening, because they do make a little bit of noise, although it's not quite as much as most people make out, but it, but there's some noise there to be concerned about, especially within a residential zone. So I it was very much into the mining space, was about to go all in, but then the market collapsed in 2018. And I just kind of took a step back and was like, you know, maybe I should, I sh even though I'm excited about this technology, Maybe it's good for me to wait and kind of see and develop uh, a better understanding of what I want to do. I don't want to lose you know, all my money in the process as well, too. So uh, from there, I decided to kind of keep studying Bitcoin and continue to educate myself on it. Back, I mean, back then, I had no idea that Bitcoin mining could be used to balance the grid. So that's something I learned along the way. I kind of just became completely silent um, as a, like an anonymous person on the Internet, just learning and reading. And went through the block. We went through the block size wars, or part of it at least. The, the tail end there was an incredible experience to see kind of all this stuff take place without being really involved in the conversation from a public persp perspective. As time went on, I went through a, a few different areas of my phases of my life before the one that I'm in right now. And one was that I decided to try to pursue a political career. I had wanted to do this for a long time and kind of dabbled into politics in the past. Uh, my, you know, I grew up with a dad who just all he wanted to do was talk about politics, uh, which is great, right? Uh, he really smart dude, really has a strong understanding of the political space and kind of how the levers of power work. We would he, almost every day we'd be listening to talk radio and he'd be kind of telling me what's going on and how it works and why they think this and why they think that. Uh, and eventually, I was just like, I really want to get into politics. Never had a way to get in, but then. During this break between my early Bitcoin career, 2017, 2018, and where we are now, I was like, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump in. Decided to get trained to be a campaign manager. Uh, went on to do uh, opposition research as well as other kind of pieces on the campaign trail. And then eventually ended up becoming a campaign manager for a campaign, um, a local race here in my state of Oregon. But unfortunately, you know, the pandemic all started to spur up and that, you know, kind of ended that scenario, right? Because this was a, a, a door knocking strategy mm -hmm. campaign and there was no doors to be knocked as everyone knows, um, especially here where I live in Portland, Oregon, it was very, very restrictive. Um, and I don't think anybody would have been very receptive to uh, someone knocking their doors that they don't know. So that ended. And then all of a sudden, now we have this space in my life again to try to give Bitcoin another shot. I start to see guys like Michael Saylor coming in and I go to my head and I'm like, this is, it's going to go, it's going to rip again. It's going to go on this big um, push. Um, obviously no one knows the future, but I ended up being correct. 
So I decided to jump back into the space, except this time in a very public way. I got on Twitter, I got on uh, Clubhouse, and I just started speaking about Bitcoin. And even though I had a horrible stage fright, I was like anxious to speak at first even. I pushed through it because I really wanted to make sure that I could add value to the space. Eventually kind of launched my own show, got really popular on Twitter spaces, became very popular for speaking about Bitcoin. And then as time went on, two things were happening. One, I was like, this space, although very separated from the political system in a way, where people say, oh, the money is you know separate from the government now, and that's great. I could see in some ways that we, although it was very separated, we needed to engage government more than ever before. And the reason why is because if you view Bitcoin kind of separate from the government and you think, oh, that's fine, we're all going to be okay, you might be right, but you're not taking into consideration your own personal self and your own family. Bitcoin might be outside government and the reach of government to some extent because it's, you know, it's, it's in the cloud, so to speak. Um, and now government can't debase it any longer. But you as an individual are not. If government wants to come put a gun to your head and tell you to give up your Bitcoin, you, you, know, you have two options. You can give up your Bitcoin or you can not and take a chance that they're going to put you in jail um, or kill you potentially um, or ransack your house. You don't know. We really don't know uh, what that world looks like. And I wanted to wake up. I wanted to make sure that I was just doing everything humanly possible to avoid that sort of a situation. I kind of woke up one day and I was like, oh, kind of everyone was living in this like fantasy, like, oh, we're going to move to El Salvador if the USA becomes mm-hmm. anti Bitcoin. Oh, we'll just move to another country, Our jurisdictional arbitrage. And I'm like, I have a family and a business and a home. And my family is not Bitcoiners. <laughs> like, they're not going to be like, yeah, let's, let's move to El Salvador because you don't want to give up your Bitcoin. So, it would have been the choice between Bitcoin and family. And obviously I'm going to choose family, but I also didn't want to even have to face that sort of an environment. This is, and again, this is almost two over two years ago when everybody thought there's no way the United States will be pro Bitcoin. It's too opposed to their power. They're going to fight it tooth and nail to the ground. And I just woke up one day and I was like, no, I don't believe in that future. I don't want that future to exist. So I, knowing what I know about politics and the way that the system works, having been raised my entire life, I've been being, you know, kind of educated on how the system works and how to have an impact on it. I said, well, I want to wake up and make sure we never get into that sort of situation. That scenario never has, takes place. And I started to find there was a lot of other folks out there, a lot of other Americans that felt the same way. Like, I'm not going to be able to move my family out of the country because I want to hold on to my Bitcoin. Well, that means I'm going to have to stay here and fight and fight for Bitcoin and fight for the future, fight for the future of the United States to make sure it heads the right direction. So as time was going on, kind of going back to my podcast career here, I was noticing this situation that I needed to get out there and I needed to do something to have an impact. And I was also kind of becoming less interested in doing the show over time. I was like, okay, I need to, I need to move on. So that's when I transitioned, jumped into trying to do whatever I could. I helped political candidates. I helped uh, educate folks in Congress, state level officials, whatever I could do. As more time went on, I realized I need to launch an organization. I, I can't just be like out here running, gunning, kind of a maverick style. People are going to take me seriously. I tried to work with a couple other different groups that were launching organizations. They got a you know a big jump on where I was in the position that I was in at the time. Didn't end up working out. We didn't really see eye to eye, which really in the end was a good thing, I believe, because if I had ended up staying with those groups, we wouldn't have Satoshi Action Fund. And we wouldn't have this organization that's now fighting effectively and successfully at the state level for Bitcoin. And we wouldn't have the rights of mind bill passed in Arkansas and potentially passing in Montana in a very short period of time. So I think it was the right decision. And I'll pause here because, I, again, I'm going on a lot of length again here. I appreciate that you're asking really good questions. Um, I, I think that this is kind of how it start, all started, right? I'm starting 2017, jumped in Bitcoin, had a, my political career with a strong understanding of my entire life and how that system works. Looked at Bitcoin and saw we need to become highly engaged and highly active because if we don't, the world is not going to turn out the way we want it to. And then that's what resulted in Satoshi Action Fund. And then obviously since then, I've also, you know, we've passed policy and, and launched Satoshi Action Education. Love it. 
Um, I have to say, I uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey. You know, some things are meant to be, and it appears that you were meant to be doing exactly what you're doing. And we have to commend your efforts. And it's very honorable of you to think of the world, to think of all people, instead of running away to El Salvador uh, with your Bitcoins, you know, you, you actually stood back and said, you know what, I need to make a difference and I need to stand up and defend what's ours and spread the truth that this is better for everyone. And, you know, it is easier just to escape, but you did it. And the world needs more people like you that really make a difference in changing the world for the better. And there are people out there that are doing that every day. So, um, and you are one of them. So I commend you, Dennis, for all your efforts. And I support the Satoshi Action Fund. Uh, amazing journey you had. Um, you know, you think big and you make a real impact in the community. And I read through the articles. I read through your amazing website and your education. Um, I think you're doing a fantastic thing for all. And um, a little later in the show, we're going to get into what other people can do to join your mission of spreading awareness and the right to mine. That's a big one. I love that on your site, right to mine digital assets. So please share with us the discrimination that's going on. I don't know if people are fully aware of all the discrimination against mining. What are you seeing out there on the field? Yeah, there's, you know, the right to mine bill is probably one of the most important pieces of policy that we have today. It's 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 inarguably one of the most successful pieces of policy we have. We have you know four different pieces, and all four of them have been introduced at some point or another. To, you know, two of those, including our you know microgrid and uh, orphaned oil well bill, are still working through the process in a couple of different states. But the the right to mine bill is moving. It's active. It's passed in Arkansas. The governor signed it there. Sarah Huckabee Sanders signed that into law. And then also in Montana, we are just waiting for the governor there to put a signature on it. Uh, all the third state would be Missouri, where we hope to pass it. There is um, a little bit more trouble there on the end, but we think there's a way for us to to move it through the process. The right to mine bill essentially protects Bitcoin miners from several forms of discrimination, which which have occurred in the United States. And, and typically these types of discrimination occur because people do not like Bitcoin mining. And it's that that dislike for Bitcoin mining is based around a lack of understanding of the technology. Oftentimes, people will be will say, oh, this thing uses too much energy and it's bad for the grid and it's going to cause us to produce more carbon emissions. But uh, the opposite is actually very much true, I, except for the fact that it uses a lot of energy, except that's not a bad thing. It, it ends up being a good thing. If you kind of tie that back into my comments earlier about demand response, you need a customer that uses a lot of power in order to be a healthy grid participant. Uh, the second one though, as it pertains to grid, you know, you know, renewables or the, the, the component of like carbon intensity, like Bitcoin mining is actually one of the most powerful tools for advancing renewable energy generation. Again, kind of going back to this, you know, whole point around renewables create instability on the grid. Because of that, you're gonna need customers that can help to balance the grid when renewables are not active. And Bitcoin mining is really very much one of the only customers on the planet that can do that. It can not only wind up and down when there is less renewable energy generation on the grid, it can also co-locate next to renewable energy generation. Well, that means that basically it's like, you got these wind farms, you got these solar farms, they, they could be in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, and oftentimes they kind of are in that center part of the United States, outside of kind of California and the, the Sun Belt down in that lower Western region of the United States, right through the middle of America, right through Texas, Oklahoma, and going up to Montana, you have what's called the wind corridor. And also for the most part, as long as you get up to about Oklahoma, a little bit higher, maybe Nebraska, you have this like sun corridor as well, where there's a significant amount of wind and solar available. And it's the potential for building wind and solar there is very high. Well, that's great. But at the same time, there's not a lot of people there that need that energy. So what they're trying to do right now is they want to build high voltage transmission lines. Love it. Great strategy. Unfortunately, high voltage transmission lines take a lot of time to build and can be very regulatory cumbersome. And then sometimes they don't get built at all because there might be, you might be building these 
high voltage transmission lines from you know Texas le to the left or to the right to try to get the energy to people that need it. And there might be one landowner that's like, I'm not going to let you build that through my land. And that's all it takes, right? So the, the time, this time consuming, you know, kind of regulatory dubious process of building these lines is what's holding back this energy from making it to market. And in fact, through te from Texas and particularly in Oklahoma, you have negative power pricing, negative power pricing on a regular basis because there's so much excess generation available. Well, what can you do to solve that problem? You can take a Bitcoin miner and you can literally place it right next to a wind farm or a solar farm and have it use that excess generation. And then when there's not any generation available, you can have the miners wind down and sit there idly kind of waiting for there to be more excess generation again. And there just is no other technology that can do this at scale. It doesn't exist. Now, batteries in some ways are great. And I think that those will be valuable and useful in, in, in certain components, but they you're not going to put a battery farm in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. where nobody's using the power in the first place. You can do that with Bitcoin mining. We have done that with Bitcoin mining. And we will continue to, I believe, to do that with Bitcoin mining. And that's very, very good with re for renewables. It's extremely helpful. I mean, even it's not just us saying this, that we need more flexible load on the grid, more demand response customers on the grid. It's organizations like the IEA. It's the EPA. It's DOE, Department of Energy. They're saying some of these, one of these entities, and I can't remember which three-letter one it was. I believe it's DOE, said that we need 500 gigawatts of demand response on the grid by 2030 so that we can just be on the way to hitting our 2050 goal, which is even higher. Well, where are you going to get, you know, 500 gigawatts of customer power, you know, demand that's going to be willing to just shut off whenever you need them to. It, they're thinking, oh, we'll all just have EV cars and we'll send all of our individual EV cars on and off all over the place. I love the idea. It was probably the best idea we had until Bitcoin mining came around. And <laughs> because Bitcoin mining is just the most flexible high density customer you could possibly find. So when people say that Bitcoin mining is bad, it's going to cause carbon intensity to increase, they couldn't be more wrong because Bitcoin mining is the most powerful tool to help build out renewable generation, which suffers from a lack of being able to get power to market, which means that if they can't sell that power, it hurts the ROI. And it also hurts the taxpayer because mm -hmm. they're, those renewable energy generation assets are highly dependent on credits from the government tax credits, you name it, to be able to survive. So if we don't need to depend on tax credits anymore, not only is you know the renewable energy generation asset owner benefiting and is wanting to build more renewables and lead to more decarbonization, you're also not no longer hurting the taxpayer. You're no longer printing the dollar into infinity to be able to build out renewables that nobody's using. So this is a very, very, very good. I think that we will continue to see its growth, but, it, but going back to the discrimination, it's just people don't understand this. Mm -hmm. It's a new technology. There's such a lack of education around what it can do and why it's here. So they're discriminating against thinking, oh my gosh, this thing is so bad. You know what you should do? We should zone it out so that they can't build here any longer. In fact, this happened in Missoula, Montana. They've had an emergency meeting and they said, we should change the zoning law so that these miners can't build here in this area. They did that effectively. And a miner that I know, Jason, who built his uh, Bitcoin mining facility out there, Hyperblock, ended up going bankrupt, millions of dollars lost. Perfectly great operator. You can listen to his testimony. He's a nice guy. Came to Montana to testify in favor of the right to mine bill. And it's just sad to see because there was no reason to push this guy out. He was a great operator. He was doing good. You know, occasionally we have bad actors in the space. We acknowledge that. I think every industry has bad actors. And we should be working in collaboration with policymakers to help minimize the effect of bad actors. Where there's some bad actors right now in North Carolina that we're concerned about. There's bad actors all over the place. We personally, me personally, and the industry want to be able to help eliminate bad actors from the space. So we are very favorable towards that. But that was not what happened in Missoula, Montana. They changed the zoning laws. They drove this guy bankrupt. And mm -hmm. we ultimately lost out on jobs, economic development, and also potentially the, the ability to balance the grid as well. Other types of discrimination, folks are raising rates on miners, which is very discriminatory. They're not even supposed to be able to allowed to do that at all. But they, they did it and kind of somewhat successfully in Idaho where they raised, were raising rates on Bitcoin miners there because they just didn't understand the technology. And they were also trying to forcibly say that these people had to participate in demand response without any sort of just compensation, which is actually illegal, according to FERC. FERC is the 
Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. FERC says you have to pr you know, provide just compensation. If, if someone is forced to participate in demand response, then they have to be paid for it. You can't just tell them to shut off and not compensate them for it. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable policy, I believe. Uh, the third one is uh, frivolous noise complaints. Frivolous noise complaints are all over the place in the space. There are some folks, unfortunately, this is where we see the most problem, that they don't do anything to help mitigate noise. And so, yes, sometimes the neighbors get upset about that. I think we should punish those types of bad actors. But then there are a few people that are, there's no noise at all. You can go down, you can hear, there's no noise, but yet they're going to the county board because they don't like Bitcoin mining because they think it's bad for the environment, saying, oh, this thing is creating noise and you know, it's destroying our quality of life and it's ruining the area that we live in. We should get rid of it. So those are the three things that the right to mine bill protect against. It also exempts uh, Bitcoin miners from money transmitter licenses, which just basically affirms that Bitcoin miners are much more like data centers than they are like banks. I don't think anybody is thinking in a space that Bitcoin miners are like banks. They are data centers. They support the Bitcoin network, just very much so like an Amazon data center supports the, supports the internet. So lots of discrimination going on around the country. We're going to probably see more discrimination. I already have seen different mm. types of discrimination occur. Um, and we will probably be expanding and growing the list of areas that the right to mine bill covers. But I think it's critical. This is a, a closing point here. It's critical that we protect this industry, not because I'm sort of some sort of like industry sycophant that cares about, you know, making money and pulling in jobs and for my industry. It's, it's about making sure the United States is a leader on this technology. Russia just became number two in the world in Bitcoin mining. And China actually has seemingly reversed its policy on Bitcoin mining. They now own 25% of the hash rate. So this is somewhat of like a national security issue combined with the need for energy security, combined with the need for being able to turn on our lights when there's a winter storm. There's so many reasons why Americans should want to attract Bitcoin mining. And we can't let local, you know, this is typically happening at the very local level, these county boards. We can't let these people at the local level who don't understand the technology put us in a bad position so bad that these miners end up going overseas to Russia, going overseas to China. We need to be keeping as much of the Bitcoin mining here as possible. We need to make sure the United States maintains its position as the number one Bitcoin miner in the world. Love it. You know, um, you said at so many excellent points there. And I think the, the common theme is education. And I see the complete purpose of Satoshi Action Education. People need to understand the benefits. First, we need to understand the challenges. And there are many of them. The rolling blackouts, those were horrible. I had friends in California who experienced that. You know, there's so much wasted energy that goes on. You know, these current power systems can't handle these huge spikes. And, you know, the microgrid and um, gives us this on-demand power like you spoke about. And we it has that flexibility like you said, and we need that nowadays. And we have so many issues going on, so many inconsistencies. And I think this flexibility also needs to be adopted by all the people and opening their minds to this new industry that is providing so many benefits that are actually completely 180 degrees from what people are currently thinking. It actually brings high paying jobs that we need to our local rural economies, which were hurt the most. And, you know, it's it, this wasted energy is such an important concept and it's costing the taxpayers money. And, you know, it comes down to money, what's for the economy, but also the environment. And, um, and also for convenience, the on-demand issue is key. Um, there's just so many benefits um, and the challenges like we discussed, um, you know, the wasted energy is, is, is key. It is such an important issue. Could you explain how the Bitcoin mining works with taking that wasted energy and actually converting it and, and, and making it efficient and making it consistent for all? Yeah, definitely. Great question on the waste and energy component. Real, just very briefly before I jump into the wasted energy side of things, you, t you touched on something that I think is one of the most important components of this technology in the way that it drives our economy and jobs. And that is the Bitcoin miners 
are creating jobs and economic opportunity yes. in some yes. of the most rural and economically depressed zones of the entire country. I was recently traveling to a Bitcoin mine in Corsicana, Texas. It's a riot facility down there. And I went to visit and tour that site. And I got the opportunity to not just visit the mine, but there was also a control center uh, about 100 yards away from the mine itself. I got to go through that control center and talk to the people that were working there. And I saw this gentleman over in the corner. He was standing up and he was beaming, smiling. He was a 70-year-old man. I walked up to him because it just his energy was so positive. And I was asking him, you know, what he thought about the Bitcoin mine coming to his local area. Because you hear a lot of stories about people saying, oh, these Bitcoin mines come in, they do, they're terrible, they're horrible, they're using up all the energy, they're using up all the you know resources, and they're creating noise. I went up to him and I said, you know, what do you think about the Bitcoin mine coming to your town? He was like, you know, with a giant smile on his face, saying he absolutely was so thankful that Bitcoin mining as a company, Riot, came to his town and decided to create these jobs because for the first time in a long time, he had dignity of life because of the job that he had, a job that was not being provided by anyone else, a job that pays well and provides a consistent salary to someone who's 70, right? And again, this is not someone, you know, when you're 70, you're not learning like totally brand new, like tech job skills. You're not going to learn how to code. Like I can I try to learn how to code and I, <laughs> I couldn't barely do it. So, and um, I just think there's something to be understood here is that you're not just creating jobs in rural zones, you're creating jobs that rural people can have. These are low, low training, so they require very minimal uptake in order to be able to take on these jobs. You're not importing workforce from outside mm -hmm. the rural area. You are giving jobs to people that have been left behind by the economic system that we have created, which has resulted in manufacturing going overseas and leaving folks in the middle of this country behind. And I think it's a critical point to be made. And folks that stand against Bitcoin mining and say that it shouldn't be in this country are directly opposed to people in those areas of the world who have been the most hard hit mm -hmm. having access to good opportunities. And the people that stand against that really should look themselves in the eye when they wake up in the morning and say, I stand against rural Americans having jobs because that's what's happening when you decide to kick Bitcoin mining out of this country. So I think it's a really important point. Very important. On the other, on the other component, wasted energy. So there are two types of, there are, there are, I would say there are two major types of wasted energy in this country. You have uh, wind and solar, renewable energy generation assets, that's one of the biggest ones. So in California, for instance, you have the uh, wind and solar industry there is being tracked by uh, KISO, which is, so there's seven different uh, RTOs and ISOs in this country. And they basically are regional operators of transmission lines and uh, power markets. And in California, there's is called KISO. It's almost the entire state, not quite but almost the entire state. And in that state, they track how often wind and solar energy generation assets, you know, wind down or turn off because nobody needs the power. Like they can act, they can create power. The wind is blowing, the sun is shining, but no one needs it. They track that number. And currently right now, they curtail 2.5 million megawatt hours of energy every year. That's a, that's a lot of power. I'll put it in context in a moment. By 2030, they plan to double their wind and solar generation, which let's just assume if they double that number, that they're going to double their curtailment. It could be lower, it could be higher, but let's just do back of the hand math because nobody's really going to know that number until we get there. By 2030, if they double that number and they double their curtailment, which means they double their wasted energy, it'll be 5 million megawatt hours that they don't use every single year. That is enough power, or that is more power than the bottom 36 nations combined. It is an incredible amount of energy that is being wasted every single year within the California power market. So when people say, oh, we don't have enough energy. Oh, you know, we need to go <laughs> exactly. uh, tackle. And it's like, no, no, there, there is way more energy than we could possibly mm -hmm. ever need. It's, that's just one state. That's one state that that's occurring in. And this problem of curtailment, wasted energy from wind and solar is happening all over the country. In fact, it's happening all over the world. So that's a unique opportunity that only Bitcoin mining can really tackle. Batteries, again, will be good. They'll be helpful. But the, the, the issue is much bigger than what batteries can solve. I think batteries will be a big part of the transition in the future. The other type of wasted energy is from methane gas. Mm. Methane gas not only is a, a source of energy because you can take it, it's combustible. You can put it into a turbine or a generator and use it as fuel. You can create electricity with that. And then you can mine Bitcoin or do other things with it. So not only is it a fuel, it is a potent greenhouse gas. 
Methane as a gas is 84 times worse than carbon dioxide for warming over a 20 year period. It is 27 times worse over a hundred year period for warming. So anytime you can mitigate this gas, not only are you taking something that was wasted as an energy source and turning it into something of value, you're also having a very positive impact on the environment, on the environment in a couple of ways. One is that it doesn't go into the atmosphere, cause warming. And two, that it, some at sometimes it actually goes into the groundwater and, and you can sort of contaminate groundwater along with other pollutants that follow. So very, very positive when mitigated for the environment. The way that Bitcoin mining can come in is a few different ways. So there's several different sources, many different sources of, of methane in the United States. The two biggest ones that I would like to highlight is from the oil and gas industry and from, and from landfills. So landfills is the most interesting one, in my opinion, because landfills are, you know, you, you put all your trash in a big pile, right? And you cover it up. And over time, even if you don't add any trash to that landfill, the next like 30, 40, 50 years, that landfill will generate methane gas. And so it's kind of somewhat of like a renewable gas. Like it's always going to be there no matter what you do. And we're always going to be creating more trash and throwing more things away. So that's this is something that's a very big problem in the United States. And in, and it's something that Bitcoin mining can tackle. Now, there are other industries that are tackling it as well. If you, I don't know if you've ever gone to a big city and you see, you know, it says like the buses or the trash trash trucks are powered by renewable gas. Mm -hmm. That's that's what they're talking about. But oftentimes these landfills, they're in the middle of nowhere and there's no way to get that gas to market. So who is going to come in and be able to use that gas? have a positive impact on the environment and boost the economy and use a wasted energy asset, it's Bitcoin mining. Because Bitcoin mining can, one of the things it can do again is it can co-locate right next to the energy asset. So in the case of wind and solar in the middle of nowhere, co-locate right there on site. Same thing with uh, landfill gas. You can have a landfill in the middle of nowhere. You don't need pipelines. You don't need a grid electrification. You don't need anything. You just need a very, very weak internet signal. Strong internet signal better, but you don't need a very strong internet signal for these data centers to work simply by the economics or the, sorry, simply by the design of how the signal is sent. It's just not a very large packet of information compared to like, a, you know, this video call that we're having, for instance, uses way more data than like a Bitcoin miner sending the signal to the network. So you can have them co-locate these landfills, middle of nowhere, mitigate the gas, very positive for the environment, very positive for creating a value out of something that was wasted. The other area, so that's landfills. The other area is the mm -hmm. oil and gas industry. There are two big problems with the oil and gas industry. One is just simply that as you transport um, methane from one place to the next, along the way, there's a significant amount of uh, leak gas that can be mitigated if you're able to plug Bitcoin miners into these systems to help relieve, relieve pressure from the system. Also, oftentimes when oil and gas operators are digging into the ground and they're trying to get the oil out, there will be gas that comes out too. These, kind of, these things kind of come together, oil and gas. Uh, when you dig for oil, gas comes out. So you have to do something with it. The EPA mandates that they flare that gas off. So what that means is, you know, see those big stacks and they've got fire coming out of them? That's the oil and gas operators flaring the gas because they don't want it to go straight into the atmosphere because of how bad it is. So that process does do a pretty good amount of mitigation on methane gas. But then again, it's wasted and it's not as efficient as it could be. Again, enter Bitcoin mining. Miners can come in. They can tackle that flared gas. They can mitigate that problem even more efficiently. They can take it from like a 90, I think it's like 90%, 95% to nearly 100% efficiency. And then also, again, creating value out of something that was totally wasted before. There are a couple of great companies that are doing this today. Uh, you have Giga Energy, and then you also have Crusoe. Uh, Crusoe just did a crazy big, like in a good way, uh, video with the World Economic Forum talking about the value of digital asset mining to be able to tackle this issue. Something I didn't, I did not think the World Economic Forum would be promoting Bitcoin mining this soon, but this is the world we live in today. We're starting to see the incentive structures around Bitcoin take over in areas that we didn't think would even be a part of this mission as we move forward. So wasted energy from wind and solar, wasted energy from oil and gas, wasted energy from landfills. There's not even like enough, this, or there's not even enough Bitcoin mining to capture all of what's going on. So as Bitcoin mining grows, I think it will grow into these markets the most because not only is this energy not being used, it's also very cheap. Wasted energy, nobody wants it, price is low, kind of makes sense. But that's where Bitcoin mining, I think, is going to grow a lot into the future. I think you'll still see a lot of this on-grid mining take place. 
but a way, the wasted energy component, I think is critical as we you know drive this conversation forward on the value of this technology. Absolutely. Wow. You know, it seems to be amazing for the economy, reduces the cost of electricity, creates more jobs, especially in these hard hit rural communities. And at the same time, is helping the environment. Um, being able to use methane as electricity for these Bitcoin miners, I mean, using it as an energy source, I mean, that's that blows me away. That's just amazing. It's like a win win across the board. Um, you know, um, we actually, one of our businesses that's a manufacturing business, and we create green equipment. We're the only ones in our field. We create a disruptor. And one of our slogans is it's good for your, for, it's good for the environment and good for your wallet. And, and just this reminds me of that. It's like, it's good for everything. It's good for the environment and for the people's pockets. Um, so to me, I just, I have to ask you, what type of challenges are you facing at the state levels? How are they not seeing this? I mean, it just seems to be win-win. And is it just a status quo bias for these um, the state people? In some ways, there are status quo biases that take place. I think that's true with any new industry. When you come in, that people are going to have their in innate biases towards something. But it really comes down to just education. There's nobody going out there and informing policymakers and regulators on how this technology works and the benefits that it has to offer, ex except I would say for definitely Satoshi Action Fund at the state level. There are folks doing it in D.C., which I really love working with those different types of groups. And, and, and then in some ways, you do have you know the advent of these state you know, blockchain councils that I think are very valuable. Like the TBC is a very valuable one. You have the Ohio Blockchain Council, Virginia Blockchain Council. Um, you also have the uh, Florida Bu you know, Business Blockchain Association, which does great work there in Florida. So there's a, a, several of these different groups, but in, in a way, you know, we need to be just dialing up the conversation. We need to be dialing up the education around Bitcoin mining because to me, it has the most immediate ability to be able to solve problems that policymakers and regulators agree are issues that we face today. A lot of the other, you know, crypto technologies, they are trying to tackle issues that I think some people don't recognize as a problem. So if you go to a policymaker that has been on this planet for 70, 80 years, you know, oftentimes these most policymakers are in their elder years, it's going to be hard to explain to them like why, you know, the dollar is not the right money and we need to advance and get away from central central currencies and we need to move on to decentralized systems like it's it just gets becomes very technical and mm -hmm. complex for them so it, as it would be for anybody but when you're trying to educate someone and you come in with a problem that they know exists and you have a solution that's really a great uh, doorway to be able to have success so when we come in we talk about how bitcoin mining provides jobs everybody wants jobs local investment Everybody wants local investment, grid stability. Everybody knows this, that our grids are becoming a problem, that we have some shortfalls in the grid that we need to be able to shore up, that um, cleaning up the environment, again, something everybody wants in the policy world. They want to reduce their carbon footprint. They want to clean up the environment, whether that be through a conservation mindset or an environmentalist mindset. And then also the ability for Bitcoin mining to enhance green, carbon-free energy mm -hmm. projects. There, when we tell those five benefits to people at the state level and at the federal level even as well, but mostly we work at the state level, when we tell people those five benefits in the policy world, there's not a policymaker on the planet that doesn't go, exactly. how is that possible? Mm -hmm. And then if they, we can convince them that it is possible, they're like, okay, what do we need to do to be able to bring this technology in? Sounds like a great idea. So that's, that's, that's how we're having a lot of success. I just think we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to stay the course on educating on this technology. We have to remember also that it's only 14 years old. It's not been around that long. I mean, it took the internet 20 years of existence before people really started to catch on uh, for on, on to what its potential was. So we just have to give it time, um, give it some more energy and give it some more resources. And I think that we will get there, at this, particularly at the state level. And at the state level, I think we'll see it boil up into the federal level. There's a reason why we went after the state level because in the United States, states have a lot more sovereignty than they do in other, you mm -hmm. know, different political jurisdictions in different countries do not have the authority that the states have. For instance, like just go to north to Canada and the provinces up there don't have nearly the autonomy that the states have in the USA. So 
We started at the state level, very much like the marijuana industry did. The marijuana industry started in, in Washington and in Colorado. They passed pro-marijuana legislation by talking about the benefits, jobs, local investment, reduced crime, increased property value. Those are actually their talking points. Mm -hmm. And then they were successful in Washington, in Colorado, and then in Oregon, in states like California. And then now, over a decade later, over 75% of the country has pro-marijuana legislation on the books, despite despite it being a federal crime to possess, distribute, and grow mm -hmm. marijuana, despite the fact that you still can't get banking on the federal level for, for marijuana yes. businesses. Mm -hmm. They've been able to accomplish this. So we do not even have that sort of an uphill battle. There, It's a, it's a, federal, it's a felony to, mm -hmm. to smoke, possess, distribute <laughs> marijuana, and they were able to accomplish this mm -hmm. at the state level. So that's our strategy. That's the one we're sticking to. We share the benefits that people understand. And we advance the issue forward. And I think in a decade, you know, we're going to pass right to mine in Arkansas. We did pass it into law in Arkansas. We're probably going to pass it into law in Montana. We might get a third state. This is kind of, it's funny. It's almost the exact same repeat of, of the marijuana industry. They mm -hmm. almost got three states the first time, but ended up only getting two. So we're in the same position right now. We're probably going to get two. We, may, we might get a third. We'll see. I would love to see if we can beat them out by one state in our first go around. So that would be very exciting. And I think would be a, that's a huge goal of Satoshi Action Fund for us to be able to uh, advance the issue quicker than they did, because that that is the guiding light for the space. And I would encourage all Bitcoiners to become very active at the state level for that purpose. Absolutely. I love your strategy and mindset. And, uh, you know, just like you highlighted history and the debasement of currency, you're looking at precedents and other you know, campaigns that have moved forward like the marijuana. And I think it's very smart. You start at the state level and you work your way up. Um, so I wish you much. I, I know you will have. How about that? I know you will have much success with these type of points that we Thank discussed you. today. Um, in 10 years, I think uh, maybe the Bitcoin miners of today or, or the future will be like electric companies. Um, you know, generating power so efficiently and flexibly. And I think right. the rolling blackouts will be part of our history and no longer an issue. Um, and then more jobs. I, I think it's going to be a, a wonderful place. And, um, you know, I um, awareness is key, you know, and understanding. And that's why the Satoshi Action education is so important. And I love what you say on your website do your own research. And that's very important for people because a lot of times they could maybe not believe how great it sounds. So when they do their own research, they see that this is all true. Because I have to tell you, Dennis, I've been doing my research for you know the past few years, mainly the past year or so. And I am blown away by the microgrids and the capabilities they have. And Bitcoin mining into all of that incorporated together it seems to just be a symbiotic relationship. And it's just seamless how it all works together. So my own research has shown this and everything I've studied. And then your website, I have to say, is so concise and to the point. And that's what's important to share these points is to just be very clear about everything. Um, and you do an excellent job at that. So I'd like to highlight your journey so far. You talked about three states and uh, what is your plan next? What are you noticing in your, is there a certain, um, I don't want to get into your little secret way of doing things, but is there a certain um, way you're tackling the country and a certain plan you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. We, we, do, we try to share as much as we can. Part of the reason why is because we want others to be able to copy what we are doing mm -hmm. and to be able to advance this issue in their own states. This is not just a Satoshi Action Fund effort. This is a whole USA, every American effort that everyone should participate in advancing. And I do agree with you that I think that utility companies and power companies are going to be the ones mining Bitcoin in the future. That's something that is talked about quite excessively in the mm -hmm. industry that we will see eventually power companies come in. Um, but as it pertains to the strategy and where we're going and why we're going, for us, it's about finding low hanging fruit. I mean, look at going back to the marijuana industry example, mm -hmm. Who, what states did they try to go to first? They didn't try to go to Texas. Mm -hmm. They didn't try to go mm -hmm. to Alabama. 
you know, they didn't go to the Bible Belt to go pass their first marijuana bill. They went to Oregon, Washington, Colorado, California. These are the reason why is because these are low hanging fruit states where they were already open to the technology and would be interested in trying to, um, excuse me, I'm switching back and forth to the, the Bitcoin there, but these are states that would be very open to marijuana mm. that would be wanting to try to bring that, that you know, sort of uh, industry into their space. And we're doing the same thing with our technology, with Bitcoin mining. We're going to states where there is a preference towards Bitcoin mining and that people are interested in seeing it come uh, and onboard it as quickly as possible. So Texas is one state that we're very active in, you know, Montana, Arkansas, it's the middle of the country where when we talk to them about Bitcoin mining and its energy consumption. They don't have that initial gut reaction. Now, I, I think that what will happen over the next you know, five, 10 years is you, we will start in these red states that believe in the value of the technology. It doesn't mm -hmm. take much to explain it to them. And then over time, we will all, we'll move into some of these blue states where they've, we've started to be able to educate them on the technology and how it's good for the environment how it's good for jobs and how it's good for local investment and grid stability. But it's just going to take a little bit more time because they have that initial like, oh, this uses a lot of energy, so it must be bad kind of attitude towards mm -hmm. it. Uh, that's going to change over time as, as we move forward, just like it did with the marijuana industry where they started in the blue states and then they've moved to the red states. And now 75% plus of the country has pro-marijuana legislation on the books. Even states that are left, the last 25%, a lot of those, almost all of them have you know, attempts, big attempts to try to pass pro marijuana legislation. So that's uh, that's our strategy as far as which states we're going after is like low hanging fruit. Like who's next? You know, for us, we like Ohio. We like North Carolina. Um, we also liked the idea of going into Oklahoma and Nebraska. We gave Oklahoma a shot this like last go around. We just kind of got behind the ball a little bit. We needed to do more education and more work there. But states like that, we think have a lot of potential. Ohio and North Carolina, we like in particular because those are year-round legislators, so we don't need to wait till next cycle. Something to be something to know about state legislative cycles is that they only happen every year, some states every two years, and they're very short. So it's like six months at most. Most states, it's like 60 to 90 days. So you have 60 to 90 days to pass a policy. There's a lot of prep work that goes into getting that ready, and um, you know that's why we were successful. I thank my team for that. I've got some incredible people that have been able to help guide that process. Um, but in Ohio and North Carolina, now that we have the success that we have with the states that are kind of short term that we needed to get done now, because almost all state policies, state uh, legislative cycles are over. So now we're going to be moving to these states where they're more year round, like Ohio and North Carolina, and trying to potentially have success there. But that's that's a strategy so far. Happy to share more with people. And if anyone's ever listening to me and they're thinking, you know, I would love to do this in my state. I would love to advance these policies and help to make a difference for my community, please reach out. You know, you can reach out to us uh, on the website or, or at info at satoshiaction.io. And we respond very rapidly to people that are interested in trying to help us advance our goals. Very nice. Thank you. So I see it seems to be the red states are a little more receptive um, right at this stage, but I'm sure it's going to be like a tidal wave going across the country once they understand the benefits um, and the much needed solutions to our current challenges. I guess your home state and my home state, Oregon and New York are a little later on in the process. Can I assume that? Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't say Oregon is as far behind as New York, but uh, New York is um, definitely <laughs> gone the, the opposite direction. I know. So, um, but I have, I have uh, long range efforts here underway in Oregon to try to head us the right direction. But yeah, it's it, he, people will say, oh, it's too bad, it's unfortunate, but I will say, Kind of a glass, I'm a glass half full kind of guy exactly. that we are fortunate that we have states and that we have some a political party that is just kind of open to this idea and that, that we don't have to convince them because the worst case scenario would be that nobody's interested in the idea and nobody wants us around mm -hmm. um, kind of like TikTok right now. Like nobody, nobody wants TikTok in the government offices right now. It's kind of, kind of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. um, they're trying to ban it like in the at the federal level. And um, both parties seem to have a problem with it because of privacy, obviously privacy concerns. Um, so, yeah. So we are very fortunate as an industry that we do have a political party and states that are open to the technology because all you need is a foot in the door and then we can continue to move and Absolutely. educate on the blue states as well. Absolutely. I think that it'll just keep spreading. Um, you know, you had New Hampshire, um, Arkansas, and then this great news with Texas. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, I think it's just time at this point, it's just going to take some time. But I think the fact, like you said, the fact that you already have states 
like Arkansas, this is a massive, I mean, major milestone for you for, with Arkansas. And I congratulate you again on that. You know, it's just a matter of time. Embrace those challenges. And uh, New York will be coming on uh, Satoshi Action Funds turf pretty soon, I'm sure. Um, but thank you so much. Um, you know, what can the people do? You touched a little upon that, but what can all the people, all the listeners do to help support and spread awareness? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much again uh, for having me on the show. I very much enjoyed coming on here to talk about you know this important issue. And if people want to help make a difference and be able to advance Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining in the United States, there's you know there's a few ways you can do that. One is I would I would jet, to be honest, go sign up for our newsletter. We talk a lot about different events and ways for people to participate in the work that we're doing. It's right on our homepage. We don't ask for anything else other than your email. So just plug your email in. You can sign up for that at satoshiaction.io. And other ways to participate that will be coming up include volunteer opportunities. So we have actually tomorrow, is it Monday? Yeah, Tuesday tomorrow, there's going to be a rally at the Capitol in Austin. I'm sure people won't have an opportunity to see this before um, we go and we, we have that rally, but we will have other rallies like that in the future. And also um, in, in uh, Miami, we probably will need volunteers for some of the work that we're going to do there in July. Uh, we're also doing a big book handout. I think that's something that people should keep an eye out for. It's going to happen at the end of June. Uh, either the second or third week of June. And we're going to be handing out very uh, pro Bitcoin mining books, any, everything from the Bitcoin standard to layered money uh, to the progressive case for Bitcoin. And the point will be to be able to bring these authors in. We actually have two authors who have already agreed to fly into DC. We're hoping to get more. And we're going to hand these books out to as many policymakers and staffers as we can possibly find and start to spread the, you know, the knowledge base on Bitcoin to the people that matter most at the highest levels of government. So lots of great opportunities like that to be able to participate. We're also always looking. If you, if you can't participate and you can't show up, which I encourage you to always show up, but if you can't do that, the one of the best ways that you can support the work that we're doing is by becoming a monthly donor to our work. We have very big monthly donor goals that we're trying to acquire right now. We just added 12 new monthly donors this last week. We want to add more so that we can be able to look further into the future and see and know that our revenue is going to be there for us to be able to accomplish the work that we're doing. You know, being able to go to these states, we have to fly in, we have to hire team members to be able to participate in the, these efforts. So it's very expensive, very difficult. And those monthly donors go a long way in making sure once added all together, even $5 added up together with 100 people makes a big difference in our budget and being able to go and be able to participate in these states and move this policy forward. So you can you can participate by showing up, you can participate by becoming a monthly donor, or if you just want to follow along, you can go to at Dennis underscore Porter underscore follow me, or you can go to Twitter for Satoshi Action, which is at Satoshi action or at Satoshi Act Fund. We didn't have that one available, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can follow along there as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us these amazing, amazing advantages of Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin and Satoshi Action Fund. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis. Have a wonderful day. Thank you to all the listeners. Thanks, Ro. Thank you for listening to The Ro Show Podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon. All investment, real estate, financial, legal, and tax opinions expressed by Rosanna Prestia or on The Rose Show should not be relied upon as professional advice and are intended to be used for informational purposes only.